You think I'd let him destroy me and end up happier than ever? No way. He doesn't get to win. Gone Girl's Amy Dunn has been called a lot of things, both in her world and in ours. She said she was complicated. Nick! Everyone knows complicated is code for Ever since director David Fincher brought Gillian Flynn's best-selling novel to the screen in 2014, we've remained torn over whether Amy is an anti-hero or a villain, a feminist icon or an irredeemable monster. She went to extreme lengths to make herself look victimized by men whose only sin was not to pay her the attention she demanded at all times. Amy has been called everything from a femme fatale for the Me Too era to a plain old psychopath. I've killed for you. Who else can say that? She's continued to leave viewers polarized over whether anyone should root for her, or even sympathize with her. The divided reaction to Amy Dunn speaks to our own feelings about female rage, a notably quiet kind of anger that we normally expect women to suppress. Cool girl never gets angry at her man. She only smiles in a chagrined, loving manner, and then presents her mouth for as Gone Girl shows us through the story of a woman whose bottled up disappointment in her husband gradually curdles into murderous resentment, this kind of repressed anger isn't just common, it's accepted. I know a few housewives that evening glass of wine starts coming at noon, or prescription pills. This is why, to some, Amy is an anti-hero for letting that anger out, and for treating those everyday transgressions like crimes deserving of vengeance. He took and took from me until I no longer existed. That's murder. Let the punishment fit the crime. Here's our take on Amy Dunn as an exaggerated embodiment of female rage, what our reaction to her says about our own gendered expectations, and why Amy's revenge doesn't have to be empowering to feel cathartic. You're watching The Take. Thanks for watching and be sure to share and subscribe. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. It's like your own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. The primal questions of any marriage. What are you thinking? How are you feeling? What have we done to each other? There is little doubt that Amy Dunn is somewhat irrational. She faces a situation that, however galling, is more or less typical. Her marriage is failing, her husband is cheating on her, and she's losing her sense of self in the world. I feel like something he loaded by mistake. Something disposable. But Amy's response isn't to get a divorce like most people would. It's to concoct an elaborate setup that will end in her suicide and Nick's arrest and execution. Then Nick will die too. Nick and Amy will be gone. This is an extraordinary solution to an ordinary problem, yet there's a cold logic to it as well. Amy's extreme reaction calls attention to just how often we downplay these transgressions, and it forces us to reckon with the disparity in how we expect men and women to behave. Much of the horror in Gone Girl stems from just how normal Nick and Amy's relationship seems. Their marriage is slightly unbalanced and quietly dysfunctional, like a lot of marriages. Everyone told us and told us and told us marriage is hard work. Abandon all hope, ye who enter. And in these characters, we can recognize exaggerated versions of the gendered roles we're asked to play to keep those dynamics alive. When I met Nick Dunn, I knew he wanted Cool Girl. And for him, I'll admit, I was willing to try. Amy represents a hyperbolized idea of society's high expectations for women. She's a classic overachiever who thinks she can succeed at anything that she sets her mind to, even crime. I want a blood test. I want a paternity test. I love death. Amy. Amy's need to be exceptional has been with her since childhood. Her parents even created a children's book character based on her called Amazing Amy, one that taught Amy from a young age that the world would always expect more from her. When I was 10, I quit cello. In the next book, Amazing Amy became a prodigy. Amy's perfectionism proves to be a double-edged sword. When she applies it to her own life, she accomplishes remarkable things. Amy is a decorated scholar 
She forged a successful career in journalism. But when it comes to her relationship, it creates an incredible strain. Amy is a winner, and seeing her marriage falter because Nick refuses to keep up with her destroys that perception. We were the happiest couple we knew. And what's the point of being together if you're not the happiest? Again, Amy and Nick's dynamic isn't unique. Women are conditioned to put more effort into their relationships. Research shows that they still take on most of the unnoticed responsibilities, like emotional labor and housework. You need to clean poorly, like he would. Meanwhile, men tend toward social loafing, a psychological phenomenon where people put in less effort in a group setting than they would individually, assuming someone else will pick up their slack. The level of effort, commitment, and emotional availability that's required to be a good husband is remarkably lower. More games? Yeah, I just want to shoot some folks. What's the laptop for? Laptoping. And when Amy expects as much from Nick as the world expects from her, he feels unfairly targeted. I would get nuts in my stomach just coming home knowing she would be sitting there dissatisfied before I even walked in the this but Nick also overlooks the fact that he's not even doing the bare minimum in their marriage. Amy's expectations may be inordinately high, yet Nick can't even maintain a baseline faithfulness to her, even when he thinks his wife has been kidnapped. We're having a vigil tonight for your missing wife, and this morning you're kissing your college girlfriend goodbye! Nick moves Amy away from everything she knows forces her to adapt to his hometown and his life, all while he ignores and cheats on her. He did the exact same thing with her. That is the most disgusting thing I ever heard. Thank you. Nick never seems to consider Amy's feelings, if he even thinks about her at all, which forces her to go to drastic lengths to get his attention. You don't know if she has friends, you don't know what she does all day, and you don't know your wife's blood type. Sure y'all are married. Nick's descent into betrayal and neglect is gradual, which is what makes it all the more infuriating for Amy. She feels she's been deceived. I inspired him to rise to my level. I forged the man of my dreams. But Nick got lazy. He became someone I did not agree to marry. After all, she's also agreed to play a role. In the film's most iconic monologue, Amy explains how she pretended to be the kind of cool girl she knew Nick wanted. I wax drip my raw. I drank canned beer watching Adam Sandler movies. I ate cold pizza and remained a size two. She knew it was all a charade, but Amy also knew that this is how the game is played, and that if they could only keep up the act, they could both be happy. But when Nick doesn't hold up his end, it leaves her playing another role. I don't get why you're daring me to be someone I don't want to be. The nagging shrew, the controlling bitch, I'm not that person. As she learns, it doesn't matter how well Amy plays the cool girl, because ultimately, the game is stacked in Nick's favor. As a man, he's allowed to remain oblivious and take advantage of all her efforts, while the failure of their marriage only takes its toll on her. Last night, I went from desperate to pathetic. I became someone I don't even like. The kind of woman I used to mock. In the end, Amy decides the only way she can win this game is by turning those stereotypical gender roles against Nick. Nick Dunn dumped his beloved like garbage. As Gone Girl author Gillian Flynn describes, Amy is someone who knows all the tropes about being a woman and is not afraid to use them to get her own way. Nick loved a girl I was pretending to be. The cool girl, the expectant mother, the battered wife, the rape victim, the helpless prisoner. Oh my god. Oh, I've encouraged him. You can't blame yourself. Amy weaves all of these various identities into her scheme, using the perceptions and assumptions around them to punish the men in her life. This is, of course, partly why her character is so disturbing. As Flynn says, she's made of a bundle of stories that she's pulled together, and at the center, she's nothing. But it's also the reason Amy is such a potent symbol. She's nothing but the tropes she performs, and she reveals that our culture is too inclined to see women in the victim's role, indifferent to their problems until it's too late, or oblivious to what their innocence might hide. Make them stop seeing her as America's sweetheart and see her for what she is, which is a mind of the first degree. For you, it, it sucks, but you, 
Well, you gotta have a grudging respect for your wife at this point, right? Are you Plenty of viewers have offered up their armchair diagnosis of Amy, that she's a narcissist or suffering from antisocial personality disorder. She's framing me for her murder. You married a complete psychopath. But despite the pervasive idea that there's something wrong with her, and despite all her twisted crimes and manipulations, many still find themselves on Amy's side. Even David Fincher agrees, saying, there are parts of the movie where I go, oh yeah, go Amy, I love Amy. So what is it that draws us to a character who seems so cold, calculating, and even a little crazy? You think you'd be happy with a nice Midwestern girl? No way, baby. I'm it. You're delusional. One of the biggest factors is exactly what leads Amy to her scheme in the first place. Nick really does seem to deserve some kind of retribution. Oh, look. He's being a good guy. So everybody can see him being a good guy. Well, you really don't like him, do you? What's to like? Even total strangers seem to pick up on something that's especially smarmy about Nick, something that is disingenuous about him. Or else you swing into your mama's boy charm offensive and that can feel glib. Nick has a generally unpleasant attitude that only makes it all too easy for the public to believe he could have murdered his wife. And at first, that goes for the audience as well. When I think of my wife, I always think of her head. I picture cracking her lovely skull. By the time we finally learn Nick didn't kill her, we've also seen that he's not necessarily innocent. Even discounting the stories of physical abuse that Amy invents to frame him, we've already seen proof that Nick is abusive in other ways, and there's clearly a dark side to him we can't ignore. Nick, why have you kept this stuff? It's like a little box of hate. I don't know, go. Maybe I hate her. But we're also used to seeing Nick's behavior not just normalized, but celebrated. In many ways, Gone Girl feels like a reaction to the lazy, self-involved man-child archetype who dominated screens in the years leading up to the film's release. Nick's idea of culture was a reality TV marathon with one hand down his boxers. <laughs> Seeing Nick punished feels like a cultural backlash to all the do-nothing men who get everything they want without really trying, who get the girl anyway, and who always get to be the good guy. He needed to learn. Grown-ups work for things. Grown-ups pay. Nick's laziness and ineptitude is contrasted against Amy's cunning and sheer artistry. And because you're you, you don't stop there. Another reason we may find ourselves rooting for her. Meticulously stage your crime scene with just enough mistakes to raise the specter of doubt. After all, it's not often we see a criminal genius who, as Rosamund Pike claims, could never have been a man. She's purely female. Amy isn't just brilliant, she has near total control over her emotions. She's unnervingly good at putting up the feminine mask that lets women curb their reactions to avoid being labeled hysterical and using it to her advantage. Amy's ability to detach herself emotionally and remain unflinching in her commitment is just part of what lets her pull off her scheme. Her character is actually defined by strengths, like creativity, critical thinking, and self-regulation, that she twists into particularly effective abuses instead. To fake a convincing murder, you have to have discipline. And in the process of her plotting, she manages to prove that she's largely been underestimated. And Nick thought he was the writer. When things don't go according to her master plan, Amy is still able to improvise. She turns to her ex-boyfriend Desi for help out of desperation, yet she knows exactly how to play the role he demands. I've been so mistreated for so long. I've forgotten how to behave. I'll move in here tomorrow, and we'll work it out together. And when Desi has outlived his usefulness to her, Amy shifts seamlessly into the next phase, doing whatever it takes to keep going, without hesitation. In the end, Amy provides us with the ultimate revenge fantasy against entitled men, and she tops it off with an infectious, albeit toxic, self-regard. The only time you liked yourself was when you were trying to be someone this might like. We can empathize with her reasoning and appreciate her impressive flair for the dramatic. And altogether, it's powerful enough to have us questioning why we'd cheer on something we'd never openly condone. She's telling a better story. No, Nick. She is telling the perfect story.
Gone Girl has all the macabre magnetism of the true crime genre, something Amy knowingly references by adding credible, consumable elements to her story. You need to package yourself so that people will truly mourn your loss. And America loves pregnant women. She makes sure to include stories of domestic violence in her faked diary entries. What scared me was how much he wanted to hurt me more. And she knowingly plays into what the journalist Gwen Ifill termed missing white woman syndrome, taking disproportionate interest in and extending extra sympathy and resources toward endangered white women. Amy Elliott Dunn. We care about you, and we will not forget." Amy turns her life into the kind of thriller she knows an audience won't be able to turn away from, and that includes us. And if I get everything right, the world will hate Nick for killing his beautiful pregnant wife. Amy's exploitation of these very real examples of victimized women has earned Gone Girl its fair share of criticism, for playing into certain tropes like the manipulative wife who traps her husband with pregnancy, or the idea that women make false allegations of sexual or physical abuse. The film has been criticized as anti-feminist. There's Amy. She's graduated from being raped to being murdered. Author Gillian Flynn told Time Magazine that she's even been called a misogynist for creating a woman character who dares to weaponize her femininity and use it for evil. Wounded, raped wife battles her way back to her husband and he deserts her. He'll destroy you. From a certain viewpoint, the film is about Amy terrorizing and dominating Nick, then essentially imprisoning him, forcing him to be who she wants him to be for the rest of his life. You went on national television and begged for me to save your life, and I obliged, but I want that Nick. As Vox's Emily Vanderwerf puts it, it depicts a men's rights activist's worst nightmare come to vicious, bleeding life. She said I raped her. First degree felony rape. Did you do it? Did you do it? But as Flynn herself has countered, the idea that a woman character can't or shouldn't be evil is sexist in itself. To decry Amy as anti-feminist just because she does bad things is an argument that relies on the same old-fashioned gender stereotypes the film is investigating and critiquing. Several critics have compared Gone Girl to Fight Club, another David Fincher film in which a charismatic yet dangerous anti-hero pushes back against oppressive ideas about gender and domesticity, channeling their suppressed rage into violence. I want you to hit me as hard as you can. You're so cute. I want to punch us in the face. As The New Yorker's Joshua Rothman elucidates, in both stories, the characters rebel against the unbearable myth of attainable perfection, substituting for it an alternative one of transcendent, authentic, freedom-giving destruction. It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. I am so much happier now that I'm dead. Yet, whereas men, and even some women, may see Tyler Durden's rebellion as something principled and empowering, they're just as likely to see Amy Dunn's actions as selfish and insane. The difference in those responses represents the very sexism that Gone Girl is trying to call out. We expect women to be victims, to quietly accept the everyday injustices they endure. And she floated down past all the other abused, unwanted, inconvenient women. While we may not agree with Amy Dunn's methods, if we're honest about this imbalance, we can at least understand where her madness comes from. She is good. Amazing Amy and the humbled husband. As Gillian Flynn has said, women have spent so many years girl powering ourselves, we've left no room to acknowledge our dark side. Dark sides are important. They should be nurtured like nasty black orchids. Year four, flowers. She led me outside to the dying rose bush in the backyard. Ugh, that's symbolic. Amy Dunn is fully in touch with her dark side, and there is genuine catharsis in seeing her nurture it and allow it to bloom, even if we recoil in horror at what we uncover. I can't watch you play house with that thing for the next 18 years. The rage and resentment she feels is extreme yet relatable, and Nick and Amy's story is emblematic of just how much tension exists within our gender dynamics. Promise me we'll never be like them. Like who? All those awful couples we know. As Ben Affleck himself puts it, Gone Girl is an indictment of how we lie to one another until, eventually, the mask falls off. And then all we did was resent each other and try to control each other, cause each other pain. 
That's marriage. The fact that we may find ourselves rooting for Amy, despite all the bad things she does, speaks to just how much we expect women to keep up their mask, to do all the work of maintaining the lie. When two people love each other and can't make that work, that's the real tragedy. And it shows us how terrifying yet liberating it can be to watch as someone stops pretending and finally lets it all go. Oh, you can stop pretending now. I'm not pretending. Perfect. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a streaming service we love. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. Whether it's a movie you've been dying to see or one you've never heard of before, there is always something new to discover. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies making it so much easier for you. They feature hard-to-come-by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser-known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline, and there are no ads, ever. This month, Mubi will present the exclusive streaming premiere of Beats. In this film, dynamic director-producer duo Brian Welsh and Steven Soderbergh invite audiences into the illegal rave scene of 1990s Scotland. The coming-of-age story is one of the most pulsating flicks of the year. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.